All right, welcome everyone. Nice to see you all here this morning. Um, my name is Bonnie Sklar, and I'm one of the second year residents here at Wills Eye. And so now I'm happy to present our first case of the morning. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so to start off with, uh, we have a 70-year-old female who presents for difficulty seeing in dim light for one year. She complains of blurry, shadowy vision um, that she notices at night or in dim light. During the day or in natural light, she does not notice any symptoms. She feels that this has been getting progressively worse over the past year, um, to the point where she's using a flashlight in her own home to help um, her see to cook dinner. She does note some increased floaters recently, um, but denies any other uh, thalamic symptoms. As far as her past ocular history, she's had bilateral cataract extraction um, six years prior to presentation with uh, multifocal IOLs. She's also status post YAG capsulotomy in both eyes. Um, for her past medical, um, she has hypertension, coronary artery disease, and arthritis. And she takes some antihypertensive medications as well as some over-the-counter medications. Um, for her social history, she does have a 40-pack uh, year tobacco history. And um, in her family, both of her parents had lung cancer and her sister had both skin and breast cancer. A comprehensive review of systems was otherwise normal. On her initial exam, her uh, visual acuity without correction with all overhead lights on um, was 2030 and 2025 with no improvement uh, with pinhole. Um, her near visual acuity, again with the lights on, um, the near card um, was normal. She had no APD. She had full ocular motility and she had full confrontational fields. Um, when her color plates were tested, she was able to complete all of them, but um, subjectively was slower uh, on the left side. She had normal intraocular pressure. Um, she had no subjective red desaturation, and she did have um, a subjective light desaturation on the left side with 70% intensity. Um, her anterior uh, slit lamp examination was relatively unremarkable. Dr. Meta, if you're here, would you mind commenting on these photos? Or Dr. Polito, if you're here. So, uh, fundus, uh, a photograph of the right eye shows uh, slightly hazy media. Disc margins are uh, sharp. Uh, cup disc is 0.0. Uh, one disc appears to be somewhat smaller as a temporal peripapillary uh, crescent. Uh, the vessels appear to be of uh, normal caliber, and um, it is a myopic fundus, uh, excuse me, a uh, very poorly pigmented fundus. Um, and there are some small drusen like changes uh, around the fovea. And on this side? Uh, pretty similar. There appears to be more of these little small, fine, yellowish dots uh, around the fovea in the left eye. Thank you. Um, any commentary to add on the autofluorescence? Yeah, it appears that uh, there are reticular pseudodrusen um, and uh, those are present in both eyes. Thank you. Um, on the initial dilated exam, um, very similar findings were noted, um, including um, uh, one plus pallor OU um, was noted. Um, so Dr. Polito, um, given these findings, what would be some things that you would consider in your differential diagnosis here? All right, so she uh, is complaining about uh, problems um, in dim light um, more than anything else. And the fundus findings are pretty nondescript. Um, but you could think of vitamin A deficiency. Um, uh, I don't see any white dots that you can see with that. But that tends to be pretty, um, when it's pretty progressed. Um, you can think of um, things like uh, carcinoma-associated 
uh, retinopathy. She's a, a big smoker. So that would be something that one um, should consider. Um, and uh, MAR, um, uh, melanoma-associated retinopathy, uh, is uh, possible uh, as well. So I'm, I'm thinking that uh, she needs electrophysiology and visual fields because her findings are far worse than what I can see in her fundus. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in the interest of keeping a broad academic differential um, listed here, um, just some genetic conditions that can be associated with nyctalopia. Obviously, our patient is 70 years old, um, so most of these would have been picked up earlier in childhood, but um, just for completeness. And then also, as Dr. Polito had mentioned, some possible acquired conditions, um, such as paraneoplastic retinopathies, um, autoimmune retinopathies, vitamin A deficiency, um, medication-related problems, and then other conditions that could just be worsened in dim light. Although, in this patient, she has had cataracts extracted already. In terms of the differential diagnosis, if you had a 70-year-old Caucasian woman who complains about decreased night vision and floaters, Birdshot retinopathy should be very high for differential as well. The fundus photos don't suggest that at all. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, so, Dr. Polito got us off to a great start with our next steps. So. Um, Actually, Dr. Pluto, would you mind commenting on this as well? Um, so this is OCT of the um, right um, macula, and uh, the uh, cord appears to be uh, unremarkable. The inner retina appears uh, to be uh, unremarkable with a good um, nerve fiber um, layer and the outer retina um, is a little uh, ratty with areas of hyper uh, reflectivity um, at the level of the um, ISOS junction. Um, so that's what I see. Perfect. Thank you. And on the other side, any additional uh, comments? Um, yeah, so there are, um, uh, we had seen reticular pseudodrusen, so there appears to be some reticular pseudodrusen um, that one can see better here than in the um, fellow eye, kind of, oh, it's not working, uh, 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 sticking uh, up be uh, between the photoreceptor and the RPE, and then there's some drusen as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Moster. Um, so for some of the additional workup, um, anything notable here to you on looks OCT? Like, looks like the RNFL is uh, normal. Everything's in the green. Perfect. And here? Ganglion cell layer looks normal too. Excellent. And for the Humphrey Fields? So uh, these Humphrey Fields 24-2 uh, are a, a little bit abnormal with uh, some scattered central and paracentral loss bilaterally, but they're, they're mild defects. Um, it could be a problem with optic nerve, could be a problem with retina, so we're not specific. Thank you. And so we did obtain um, a nutritional and atypical lab workup um, given the uh, optic nerve pallor that was seen on exam um, with all labs returning normal, nutritional labs, as well as Lyme, syphilis, and ACE. Um, at that time, we did also check a vitamin A serology level, which returned low. Um, and upon further questioning, it uh, became apparent that the patient had had a uh, remote uh, gastric bypass surgery about 20 years ago, and she had not ever been on vitamin A supplementation. Um, at this point, Dr. Moster, is there any additional workup that you would want to do given um, the low vitamin A. Um, I'd want to look at the front of her eye and see if there were any changes there. Were there any? No, there no. were not. There were not. Um, uh, you can consider electrophysiology doing an ERG. Perfect. Um, so that is what was done. 
interesting too because the reticular pseudodrusin can be seen in patients with vitamin um, A deficiency and um, so kind of puts the whole thing back together again. So you don't only have to see the, like I had said before, the white spots are pretty uh, severe disease, mm -hmm. but the reticular pseudodrusin occasionally can be seen as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so Dr. Moster, would you guide us through um, the ERG tracing? Yeah, so this is a full field ERG, and if we look first at the rod response, the uh, dark adapted dim condition, you see that in the left eye, the one where she had a little more trouble with color and things like that, the B wave is depressed um, and uh, borderline depressed in the right eye, so mild abnormality. Uh, there's a slight delay of the uh, A wave and here the B wave as well uh, to the dark adapted uh, bright condition. You see it a little better here in the, in the higher uh, luminance, a little bit of a delay here and there. If we go to the uh, cone response, uh, it's normal bilaterally, and the flicker response is normal. So this is a very mild abnormality uh, in rod function, um, milder than you'd expect based on her symptoms, just like the retinal findings were milder than you'd expect. OK, great. Thank you. And at this point, Dr. Moster, are you comfortable with the diagnosis, or would you want any further testing, would like genetic testing? I think that I'd be comfortable knowing her vitamin A is low and she had a gastric bypass, that this is vitamin A deficiency. Fair enough. Um, we did obtain genetic testing. Um, it showed just a few different heterozygous variants of uncertain significance. So likely, unless Dr. Polito, you see any. Which shows what happens when you get genetic <laughs> testing that's not bogus. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I think probably I would have supplemented with vitamin A because mm -hmm. that, you know, my initial was, you know, vitamin A, perineoplastics. Um, uh, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the bypass history, um, mm -hmm. but um, knowing that it fit within though that realm, I would have tried to fix the vitamin A mm -hmm. before. And then, if there were still problems, then look for other possibilities. But now you're stuck with these, and you know you you, don't, you usually don't know what to do with them. Yeah, exactly. She did have such a strong family history of uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to go down that path. Yeah. All right. And so, ag agreed, as everyone has said, um, vitamin A deficiency is the diagnosis that brings everything together. And um, Dr. Moster, at this point, how would you manage this patient? You want to supplement the vitamin A, and you want to try to give her some uh, intramuscular vitamin A if you can. Right. So um, we did attempt to get that for our patient. Um, she was unable to receive the IM injection, some um, barriers to that. But um, we did replete her vitamin A levels with uh, 10,000 um, international units daily for the, over the course of six months. Um, with steady increase in the serum level of the vitamin A, um, to the point where at her six-month follow-up visit, she actually had complete resolution of all of her symptoms. Um, it completely reversed, um, and the vitamin A level had increased uh, to uh, the nor with it, well within the normal range at that point. Don't forget, when you have vitamin A problems, look for the other fat solubles. Mm -hmm. um, so it's A, D, E, and K. Yeah. So, um, and E can, um, vitamin, low vitamin E levels can worsen the problems because it's an antioxidant, so it makes it harder on the photoreceptors. Okay. Um, Dr. Polito, at this point, um, looking at her follow-up OCT, do you see any changes? Um, it looks less ratty out here than it did before. You still have some reticular pseudodrusin um, present. Um, so how much was the vitamin A and how much was, you know, underlying reticular pseudodrusin is hard to know. How do you know the reticular pseudodrusin? Because it, as opposed to uh, um, being under the photoreceptors, they are kind of on the surface of the photoreceptors. All right. And then Dr. Moster, would you 
comment on our follow-up visual field here? Visual field's a bit better, and OD more than OS. I mean, it's more normal. Thank you. I noticed we didn't get electrophysiology. It was, is that because it was just such a slam dunk? Oh, no, we did get the electro. Did we repeat the electrophysiology? No. No, OK. That's right. Yeah, Mark had talked to us. Sorry. Brain gone. Um, most, most people nap when I talk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, vitamin A deficiency um, is one of the leading cause of preventable <laughs> blindness worldwide. Is there another comment? Um, so vitamin A deficiency is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness worldwide, um, primarily affecting the developing world. Um, there, it's estimated that between 250 and 500,000 children um, become blind yearly due to vitamin A deficiency. Um, this is obviously much less common in the United States, um, but given the uh, rise of the obesity epidemic and an increasing population of patients undergoing bariatric surgery, um, there's now an increased pool of patients who are susceptible to malabsorptive type of syndromes. Um, vitamin A is, as Dr. Uh, Polito was mentioning, is one of the fat-soluble vitamins present in milk, meat, fish, and eggs. Uh, it also can be consumed through leafy uh, fruits and ve uh, leafy vegetables and fruits in the form of carotene and broken down. Um, so as far as the role of vitamin A um, and the I, uh, kind of two-pronged, um, most well-known is its role in retinal phototransduction. Um, vitamin A is required for regeneration of rhodopsin. Um, it also helps maintain the conjunctival and corneal epithelial surfaces, um, mainly through goblet cells. Um, and some of the most uh, common ocular symptoms that we see, as um, we discussed at length, uh, nyctalopia or difficulty uh, adjusting to dim light. Um, and this is one of the earliest and most common findings. Um, at a, you know, further down the spectrum, um, you might see symptoms of xerophthalmia, um, including dry eye, um, bateau spots, which are these um, gray perilimbal conjunctival plaques that are made of keratinized kind of conjunctival debris. Um, that you can see that on the picture uh, the upper right. Um, and in severe cases, um, patients may progress to corneal ulceration um, with ultimate corneal liquefaction, called keratomalacia, and that's on the bottom right. Other findings um, that have been reported are, include visual field loss, retinopathy, as we've discussed, um, and decreased immune function. Um, interestingly, we actually had a case recently published um, out of Wills um, by Dr. Xu and Dr. Suarez in our retina department. Very similar case um, um, with a 65-year-old female uh, with a history of Crohn's disease, um, having undergone multiple uh, bowel resections and ultimate, who ultimately developed short gut syndrome, um, who presented with uh, vitamin A deficiency retinopathy. Um, this patient, similar to ours, had um, a fundus exam with yellow-white spots um, uh, these are some of the characteristic findings um, that so these spots may or may not resolve with repletion. Um, in, in this patient, they did not. Um, this patient also had similar OCT findings, as Dr. Polito described um, in our patient, with hyperreflective deposits beneath the ellipsoid zone band um, and characteristic hypoautofluorescence. Um, and interestingly, it's thought that these um, lesions or deposits may represent accumulated photoreceptors and associated debris. Um, again, as Dr. Polito was saying, sub, um, subretinal, but not beneath the RPE. And the other thing, too, is like this case is like the four plus case, right? Mm -hmm. With the, all the white dots over here. This case, your case was much more subtle. Mild. Yes. Are the white dots the reticular sinators? Uh, don't know. The, uh, n maybe not because they don't show the same way. It's probably um, abnormal um, um, photoreceptor seg outer segments. All right, and then just a, just a quick aside about bariatric surgery in general. Um, so there are three main um, categories of bariatric surgery. Um, the 
uh, those that are considered uh, restrictive surgeries versus malabsorptive surgeries. Um, the restrictive surgeries basically um, make the stomach smaller without removing any absorptive surface area um, from the small intestine. So that would include um, laparoscopic gastric banding and sleeve gastrectomy, um, whereas the malabsorptive surgeries, um, which is what our patient had had, um, including ruin y gastric bypass and biliopancreatic diversion, actually remove a segment of the small bowel. Um, and so therefore, those patients are at a higher risk of developing um, malabsorptive type syndromes, uh, including deficiencies in the vitamins and mineral minerals that we had discussed. Dr. Eagle? Yeah, one of my favorite teaching cases that's in my review course is the woman that uh, presented to the uh, Wills ER a few years ago with keratomalacia, who was a chronic alcoholic with zero levels of vitamin A. And she, you know, she just perked her cord ear. Her, her fellow eye was totally dry. There were, there were folds of the conjunctival and slip lamp examination. And that was because of her liver? No, just because she, her so, uh, t only source of nourishment was alcohol. <laughs> All right, so in summary, um, we have a seven-year-old female um, with a history of remote gastric bypass who presented with uh, progressive nyctalopia for one year. Um, on OCT, we saw a lipsoid zone disruption, um, confirmed uh, diagnosis with low serum vitamin A levels, and then again, saw some mild ERG changes uh, likely consistent with vitamin A. Um, repletion of her vitamin A led to complete reversal of her symptoms. And so, again, takeaway point, just um, in any patients who've had uh, bariatric surgery, um, even if it's in the remote past, they may still be at risk of delayed presentation of a malabsorptive type syndrome. That's a great case. Thank you. And it reminds me, of, for those who tuned in in June, our Center for Academic Global Ophthalmology lecturer was Al Summer. Uh, who used to be dean of the School of Public Health at Hopkins. And he told the story of his intervention with vitamin A supplementation in Indonesia as a young researcher, where the children were be give, being given simple vitamin A supplementation. And as he looked at their follow-up, late one night he realized that there were many fewer children in the non-supplementation group over the years. And that's when it hit him uh, that the mortality was increased. And, and uh, Bonnie talked a little bit about immunologic and other issues. But it was a huge child mortality problem. And because of the eye research, World Health Organization and other organizations now supplement children in those types of areas where they don't get enough vitamin A because it, it's a huge public health issue. All right, thank you, Dr. Haller. All right, um, I'm Louis Kai. I'm a third year resident here, and we'll get started with the second case. I have no financial disclosures, and I have no um, discussion of off label medications. So, here we have a 50 year old female presenting to the Retina Clinic, also with difficulty driving at night. Um, <laughs> medical surgical history, depression, and anxiety. Um, keeping with the theme here uh, medications, Ambien and Rizotriptan, and review systems positive for weight loss, shortness of breath, fatigue, headache, and also pulsatile tinnitus. Um, so her physical exam, she's 20, 20, 20, 25, not mentioned here, her color plates are actually full. Um, her interior exam is relatively unremarkable, no bateau spots. Um, thank you, Dr. Polito. I know you only do strabismus usually, but uh, we have another <laughs> fundus photo for you, um, if you could mind commenting. Um, so um, opto pseudo color um, uh, um, fundus photograph of the uh, right eye shows clear media. Uh, the disc margins appear to be um, somewhat um, obscure, um, 360. Um, the uh, veins appear to be uh, dilated. Um, periphery appears to be unremarkable. And um, there, the Phobia is difficult to ascertain at this point, but nothing remarkable there. Right. Oh, we agreed the phobia was nothing remarkable, and we did appreciate the 360 disc edema in the left eye. Similar findings. Would you agree? Uh, yes, and uh, I can still see the vessels, so um, it's not um, super severe disc 
um, it, uh, uh, swelling, though I defer to my neuroophthalmology um, colleagues. And the veins here appear to be somewhat dilated as well. Right. Um, we were able to get a couple other images that might be helpful to help us uh, differentiate pseudodrusin. Do you see any signs of hyperreflectivity here? I do not see um, on the fundus autofluorescence evidence of that, neither here. Yeah. And then we do have an FA here as well. We were um, lucky to obtain. Any comments on the FA? Uh, there's some. Boy, what a break! <laughs> <laughs> Holy hell! <laughs> Can't be like that. <laughs> there's, there's some staining, um, and um, that's all that I see. Same on the same other side. Same. So here we kind of have we agree two plus three sixty disc edema on both sides. And uh, Dr. Dunn, I think uh, you had a little role in the, in the care of this patient as well. What, what were some of your thoughts? There weren't any vitritis um, that we could see. We didn't see any other um, vasculitis as well. In terms of etiologies, um, what, what are some of your initial Im impressions? So if there's no vitritis, why are you asking me? Because <laughs> he's tired of asking me. Because of, because of the pulsatile tinnitus. So I, I, would get, like, uh, I would get genetic testing. Um, it's more like, more like um, because infiltrative lesions of the optic nerves and maybe posterior uveitis can cause disc edema. So you can, but in the absence of, of retinal changes, you're thinking more optic nerve, either primary or secondary. With that uh, history of cigarette smoking, you know, you worry about the possibility of metastases and uh, something causing elevated intracranial pressure. Um, as an isolated uh, optic nerve swelling, sarcoidosis would be your, your most common cause. Uh, didn't sound like she had any other systemic symptoms of that. Um, lupus can give you an isolated optic neuropathy, but you'd be much more symptomatic than she was with the optic neuropathy. Uh, giant cell arteritis, but it's bilateral. It obviously doesn't have the classic presentation for GCA. Mm -hmm. Right, and Dr. Moser, any other thoughts about bilateral optic neuritis? But ner uh, nerve edema versus unilateral? Well, the main thing is elevated cranial pressure, right? right. Um, and that's what you really worry about. Great. Yeah, so uh, papilledema, intra elevated intracranial pressure, also infiltrative lesions, papillitis, like diabetes, posterior uveitis. And papilledema has many, many causes. Um, can we have intracranial tumors, hydrocephalus, IH, and, and so on. And so what is our, uh, our favorite next thing to do, Dr. Moster? I think I would do an MRI and an MRV venogram. Right, so we went to the Will's Eye emergency room and we got, uh, here's an MRI T1 post. Um, I take my word for it that the rest of the brain looks okay, it's a little cut off here, but in terms of the optic nerves, anything remarkable to you? You just see a little bit of elevation of the disc right there perhaps. Right. The nerves themselves look okay. Yep, and this is a coronal cut um, here and uh, also the nerves look okay here to you? Yes. You don't see any flattening of the posterior surface of the globe. Yeah, if you go back uh, to, the, the, to the axial, yeah, I, I, maybe a little flattening there. What do you think, JP? Mm, maybe. Not on the left side. Right. Um, we also found some incidental white matter changes, which we consulted neurology on, and they recommended a battery of tests to rule out demyelinating diseases. Um, and so we, we, were, we were able to, also lucky enough to draw a bunch of labs, uh, which were normal. Uh, a lot of were you lucky enough to get an MRV venogram? Yeah, but the MRV was normal. Uh, they're, they're, they, they didn't comment on the, any stenosis. What venogram. a lucky day. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of lucky labs here. That was memorable. <laughs> that were normal. Uh, and uh, what are some additional tests that you'd like to see, Dr. Surgat? Well, first of all, lots of things can cause white spots on the MRI. Uh, so uh, jumping to demyelination is, is the wrong leap here, all right? Uh, so I think you have to go back here and say, how old is she? She's 50 years old. 50 years of age. So giant cells out of the picture, okay? And she doesn't have acute visual loss at this point. So we got to go back and think, you know, we got bilateral optic nerve edema. Uh, could it be something uh, that is inflammatory? MS unlikely, but NMO, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, very possible, in, especially in this age group, this gender and this ethnicity. Uh, 
So I think NMO is a real concern here. Uh, you go back to her history, and you know we've got a negative MRI, negative MRV, so we really don't know what's going on, uh, but she's got bilateral optic disc edema. So your decision now is, uh, do we manage this as an inpatient or outpatient? Right. Um, some of the additional tests that we, that we were able to, to do, um, a lumbar puncture, uh, we were able to get neurosurgery to help us with lumbar puncture, and we did discover that the, the intracranial pressure was elevated. Um, so, Mark, is that always elevated at 28? I would say it's very borderline. So we think of 25 as normal, uh, and we have to know how the LP was done. Was the patient in the lateral decubitus position? Did uh, the, the physician doing the test uh, relax the patient's legs or were the, or were the knees really uh, uh, deep into the belly and causing an elevated pressure that's really not real? So do you think this is pseudotumor cerebri right now? No. Why not? Well, number one, she's 51. She's a little bit old for it. Uh, number two, she's presenting with supposedly nyctalopia or something like that. Uh, and this is just borderline. I, I think it's possible, but it's, uh, it's not a slam dunk. How much did and she Louis weigh? Said you said she was losing weight. She was losing weight. Yeah, um, we, we see that how often in pseudotumor patients? That's the opposite. Zero. Okay. So now we're back to a 51-year-old bilateral optic disc edema. We don't have a diagnosis. Right. Sure. All right. And, you know, we've got something here that, you know, bilateral optic disc edema without a diagnosis can go on and cause permanent severe visual loss if we don't know what the hell is going on. Right. So uh, I come back to the question, you know, how many people would admit this patient? How many people would do this as an outpatient? Right. Um, uh, d would you say there are any other lab tests that, that you would want to order uh, in terms because she also had a review systems positive. Uh, she saw her cardiologist because she was feeling shortness of breath, and also she was pul pulmonologist, shortness of breath, and those all came back negative, actually. Um, and here we are, and she has a lot of review systems, a headache, um, and also the pulse is all tinnitus. Uh, what was her uh, intraocular pressure? Intraocular was normal, like 16, 17. Bob, <laughs> it's all right. I'm just, I'm just injuring you, Bob, not killing you. <laughs> it's important, you know, Bob, you can get the disc edema if the intraocular pressure is low. I don't know if you knew. Yeah, well, <laughs> she hasn't had four trabeculectomies. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so one of our other lo very lucky lab tests that we chose to order, maybe by accident, maybe, maybe we ordered a CBC for her, uh, and we found out that her hemoglobin was six. That was not discovered by her previous doc doctors, and uh, low iron, iron saturation was low, low ferritin, and elevated TIBC. So I pulled out my uh, st step one, you know, study guide. That's an iron deficiency anemia. Um, so it's interesting she didn't have any little hemorrhages in the far periphery. Sometimes you see that in the fundus with really bad anemias. Right. And remember what uh, Jose said, that the veins appeared dilated. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we did transfuse her two units. And like Dr. Surgot mentioned, we did admit her. Um, we over the objections of neurology. Over the objections of neurology. Um, in fact, over a major conflict with neurology that had me calling uh, the chair at night. Right. I didn't hear, I wasn't lucky to hear that conversation. Uh, that was well, actually the lucky part. <laughs> well, uh, Mo and I were MS fellows together decades ago, so it was friendly but forceful. <laughs> so, you know, even though she denied bloody stools and a uterine bleeding, she had a previous negative flex sig sigmoidoscopy She's inpatient now. Is this, is this something that we want to just send her out and just you know, finish her workup for uh, anemia, including the colonoscopy, or would you rather do it inpatient, Dr. Sergo? I think we have to have an answer here because anemia, we see so many times optic disc edema, it's called a non arteritic ischemic, can be unilateral or not so much you know, symmetric and bilateral here, but anemia is a highly overlooked precipitating factor of ischemia to the optic nerve. And we need to do this test in everybody. 
okay? And we have a number of people, including a general surgeon who came up from Georgia labeled bilateral ischemics, and he had this, and we've reversed his visual loss by transfusing him. Of course, they couldn't transfuse him here because he didn't hit that magic number of seven. I had to send him back to this hospital in Georgia where we set up surgery to get his blood transfusion. Wow. So uh, this is serious stuff. You know, 51-year-olds don't walk around with a hemoglobin of six. They can stroke. They can have MIs. We need an answer now, you know, not in two weeks. Did they do a stool glyac on admission? They, they did, but the, the, you know, there's sometimes there's issues with collection. And uh, so we went to the next best thing. <laughs> uh, What's the collection problem? <laughs> There used to be there used to be a test called a rectal exam. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, a little rusty on that one. Um, but you know, I was able to consult the GI fellow for this one, uh, so we were able to get a colonoscopy. You know, uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Hal, for being here. Just like uh, I haven't had a rectal exam in a while. I mean, done a rectal exam in a while. <laughs> um, can you help us interpret some of this uh, this uh, colonoscopy? It looks like there's the findings. The findings. Yeah. There's the, the, the text sign here. There, they discovered... There's that mass. If you read, yes, if you read the little labels, you'll see that there's a mass in the cecum. Yeah, so we helped her discover a mass in the cecum. And thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Eagle, for being here. She underwent resection of the ileum, cecum, ascending colon, portion of the proximal transverse colon afterwards, making sure to keep her hemoglobin high enough for the surgery. Um, and we were able to have some, uh, some path slides, thank you, uh, to the Jefferson Path Department. And uh, Dr. Eagle, any comments on, uh, on, on this path slide? It's not the eyelid, but... Uh... <laughs> no man here. So, yeah. so uh, from, from what I can remember from histology, the, the right side is the cancer, the left side is the muscular propria, and it's being invaded. Uh, they call it a T3. And uh, this is a uh, focal mucinous features, and also thankfully negative for a lot of testing, uh, KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, and uh, microsat microsatellite instability testing, which is good, good news for her prognosis. And also good news is that 12 resected lymph nodes were negative, and there was no evidence of metastasis. So we were also very lucky to, to catch this tumor pretty early. And the hemoglobin eventually improved to now 14. So Dr. Surgat, I have a month one and a month three here. Multicolor, uh, any comments you want to make here? Well, you can see here, even after she's been transfused, she still has a lot of disc edema, and it's in deep around the optic nerve, mid-retinal, and also inner retinal layers. And now you can see there's evidence that this is resolving. We start to see some green signal in the central retinal artery, which is a sign of ischemia uh, uh, with the multicolor. So uh, she's better. Uh, I just saw her last week. Uh, the colon cancer was resected right during her admission. And uh, because of the quick you know, diagnosis, uh, she now does not require any chemotherapy or radiation. If this would have been fooled around with for another month or so, who knows how many of those nodes could have been positive, right. let alone what could have happened to her vision because then you do infarct your optic nerves, right. Right? just like they can happen in the acute anemic, low, mean systolic uh, blood pressure situations postoperatively uh, in some patients with a lot of blood loss. So a, a CBC is essential in anybody with a unilateral or bilateral optic neuropathy. Right. The left eye, similar um, improvements that we saw uh, in terms of the, the OCTs. Do you, you agree with the improvement in disc edema? Yeah, and you know, it, it's interesting. It's sort of rather mild elevation compared to the normal uh, FDA-approved age and gender match database. Uh, but you can see here, even on the infrared images, the uh, edema, which then clears. Uh, so you have to look at the, all those uh, images there. But uh, uh, as Dr. Polito said, the fundoscopic picture was one of disc edema uh, which was, you know, very well picked up very early. And uh, this whole thing, uh, I think, really is a life-saving diagnosis for her. Right. It's an amazing save. I mean, 
her, she's, her life is safe from colon cancer by coming in for the nyctalopia. If you go back to that last picture, okay, she, to, the, to Jose's point about the uh, venous dilation, yeah. and you could see the vein getting thinner and less yeah. tortuous, too. She, the did she have, she had uh, visual uh, night changes, too. Yeah, she was having trouble driving at night. That was yeah. her, her main So I, I think if you go back to Mark's case, in this case... Nyctalopia and uh, colon cancer, wow. We don't want to be giving a litany of, you know, uh, rare, rare diseases. Before you create a differential, ask yourself, where is the pathology? And it's either in the outer retina, rods and cones, or as Mark said, optic nerve. So they're the two anatomic areas we must think of first localize it, then talk about what it could be. And then that will give you a much more focused uh, evaluation. Right. Um, What's the current recommendation for colonoscopy, starting age 50? It uh, depends on your family history, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so yeah, we did see. Now, now the, the right side had a little bit of uh, higher false negatives, like 9%. but. Would you say there's like a, any pattern in the visual field, or is it just probably retesting? Pattern of inconsistency. You know, only 86% of patients have inconsistent visual fields of presentation, according to the ocular hypertension trial. Uh, so, you know, now in Europe, the European Glaucoma Society wants six, base, six fields before they'll establish a baseline for clinical trials. Yeah. This is a subjective test, not objective. Right. So the, this, 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 these changes could possibly be uh, re re retest, um, you know, improvement. But you know, there is an improvement in the testing after her treatment. Um, so a couple of uh, of uh, studies I found. Um, it could be like Dr. Sergei. It could be related. Anemia could cause a kind of ischemic issues. But also, there's, there's some data that says that anemia has some relationship with papilledema. Uh, meaning that it could increase the viscosity of the blood, which could decrease the rate of CSF outflow, and then uh, can, yeah. you know, well, uh, do you buy these theories? Are there the, the current well, associations uh, unknown? Uh, you know, decades ago when I was a resident, uh, they used to think that iron deficiency anemia was a cause of pseudotumor cerebri. I see. Uh, I'm not doubting there can be some mild increased intracranial pressure for whatever reason. But the basic thing here is hypoperfusion. This is ischemia. You know, well, let's not get carried away, as Mark said, with a lumbar puncture of 28, right. when that can certainly also be variability of testing. You know, we really have to be strict as clinicians. What is our subjective data, and what is our objective data before we move forward, especially with complicated cases? So these are valid observations. But I'm, I'm not yet willing to tie them together as right. a, a unifying hypothesis. Right. What's the mechanism um, of increased viscosity of the blood in iron deficiency anemia? Yeah. They're, they were saying stuff like the red blood cells um, have yeah. low, low iron and their shapes are all yeah. weird. Yeah. I'd be cautious of neuro-ophthalmologists talking about blood viscosity, <laughs> yeah. as, as JP uh, uh, correctly pointed out. It's just like when you see an ophthalmologist publish a paper in a neurology journal, beware. Or if you see a neurologist publish a paper in an ophthalmology journal, beware. Because the reviewers were usually not uh, uh, versed in that. Right. Um, so, you know, you know, the thing is, like, like we, 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 there's another study I found recently saying that the people with bilateral disc edema and anemia tended to improve more um, with the correction of the anemia. Uh, versus people with just bilateral, like disc edema or typical IAH. And it's they have pulsatile tinnitus. Yeah. So that's a, I was just going to talk about this. For the, You get somebody with pulsatile tinnitus, we think of increased intracranial pressure. Uh, very instructive case of uh, somebody from a medical family develops pulsatile tinnitus and the MRI, so that's, this is an emergency for neurosurgery. That person I'm talking about had a huge ACA aneurysm with a daughter aneurysm that Pascal Jabor eclipsed successfully, but it was sort of being pushed off as a nothing. So pulsatile tinnitus can represent enlargement of an intracranial aneurysm. So uh, Mark you know, mentioned get the MRV, but 
We also should get MRA at the same time when these patients come into our emergency room. Okay. Thanks for those teaching points. So, you know, despite improvement in her visual fields, headaches, shortness of breath, fatigue, um, she still had difficulty driving at night. So we went back and re-examined her interiorly. We noticed that her cataracts um, had gotten worse, especially in the left eye. Can you say that? We sent her to the CPEC clinic, and it's time for cataract surgery now. And so uh, in summer, we have a 50-year-old woman with bilateral disc edema, discovered to have anemia, secondary sequelae carcinoma, thankfully completely resected, and to be non-metastatic. Um, her exam visual fields improved, um, and I appreciate everyone for uh, being here. Thank you. Thank you.